Hey there fellow classic comic collectors, as always I'm Scott Harris King and today I've got a short little bonus video for you today as I'm going to talk about using Indiegogo's In Demand as something that I'm looking at as a comic book creator. I'm going to talk a little bit about what it's for, um, what it's used for, how you use it, and just a little bit about my brief experiences so far with the platform. Um, as a comic creator, of course I like to uh, share whatever information I have with my fellow comic creators, so I do like to do these videos from time to time. I know I also have a lot of people that watch videos here that are more interested in the back issues, and of course I'm still going to have those. So this is a bonus video. Don't worry, it's not taking the place of your regular back issue deep dive. We're still going to have a new haul video in a couple days where I've got a big pile of uh, haul comics to show everybody. Uh, but today I'm just going to be talking a little bit more towards the uh, creators out there um, because it's something that I'm looking into like now that my Kickstarter is over um, what do I do with all of these comics that I've just printed and so one possible solution that I've been looking into is what's called Indiegogo in demand now um, I've shown this before here's my comic book the crime busters there's issue one there's issue two Issue three. Now I just finished with the Kickstarter for issue three, as we've seen. I did a like an unboxing video a little while ago with issue three, and so now I've got all these copies of my comic. I've got, I've got piles of my comic all over the house, particularly issue two, because I had that printed just before the pandemic, and I was planning to go out to all these conventions last year. I had all these conventions lined up, and I've got all these piles of comics ready to sell to people, and now I've got no way to get them to people because all the conventions last year were canceled. All the conventions so far this year have been canceled. And so for me, as uh, someone who doesn't like distribute through Diamond or something like that, it's a real challenge of what do you do with these comics? How do you continue to get new readers and also get comics into the hands of readers after your Kickstarter campaign ends? And so what Indiegogo has done, for those who aren't familiar, it's another crowdfunding um, platform like Kickstarter, but it works a little bit differently, and they have a thing called in-demand. Now, what in-demand is, is basically once you have a successful crowdfunding campaign, either on Indiegogo or on any platform, including Kickstarter, you can then have an ongoing campaign where it keeps all of your rewards and all the information right there, and so rather than people only being able to come for a three-week or a four-week window and only pledge during that time, they can come at any time and it's just up all the time. Uh, so there's certain pros and cons to this. Um, the main question is basically to ask yourself is, what's actually the use of this? Now, I have my own store. I have my own website and I have my own store. And so theoretically... Once the Kickstarter campaign is over, I can just send people to my own store to buy it. And if I send people to my store, I don't have to have any fees that go out to someone like Indiegogo because they're going to take like a 8% fee for having this in-demand set up. The other thing with Indiegogo that I've discovered is that when you're offering rewards in Indiegogo, they have to be at a discount from market value. So for instance, I sell my comics for $8. It's $8 and you get at least $12 worth of entertainment out of it. But I sell them for $8. And so on Kickstarter, you go and you buy it, it's $8. Well, when I go to Indiegogo, I can't sell it for $8. I mean, I can, but you have to list both the price that it's available to the new backers, but also the retail price. So in order for me to list it at $8, I'd have to lie and say that I'm selling it for nine, which anyone can see is not true because everywhere else it's eight. So basically I have to offer it at a slight discount. So if I send someone to my store and they spend eight dollars, I'm going to get almost all of it. The only thing is going to be a small fee from Stripe for the credit card use. If I go to Indiegogo, I'm still going to have that same Stripe fee, but they're also going to take eight dollars off the top and eight percent off the top, and they'll be taking that percentage out of a smaller amount of money because I have to offer them on sale. So that being the situation, why use it? Well, first of all, there's some people that don't have their own website set up. I mean, I think it's a good idea to have it set up to, to have, you know, ownership of the land that you're building on. Um, but if you don't, then this is a great um, option to have set up. The other thing that it does is that, in theory at least, it engages the Indiegogo community. So nobody's going to my website unless I send them to my website. With Indiegogo, 
and Kickstarter, that's mostly true. Most of the people that like back my project on Kickstarter or back your project on Kickstarter, they're going to be people that, that you send to that. But there are also going to be people that just stumble on it. So there might be people that are searching for comic projects on Indiegogo. They're searching for keywords. They're just browsing and they'll come across your project. That's not going to happen on my own website because no one's going to just stumble onto my website. But Indiegogo has got, you know, hundreds of thousands of people that go there for different projects. They may stumble across it, or it's possible that at some point Indiegogo itself may decide to promote my comic, um, in which case, basically, I have the opportunity to get a lot more eyes on it. The other thing you can take advantage of, um, which I'm doing, although not to the full effect, I think, is that when your Kickstarter project ends, your Kickstarter page now also stays live. It's just people can't actually pledge anything, but there's a button that you as the creator of the page have control over and you can link that wherever you want so what i could do is i could link it to my store but what i'm actually doing is i'm linking it to the indiegogo campaign that means that anybody that's still browsing for this stuff on kickstarter or for instance if they're following some watching an old video of mine or clicking on an old social media post of mine where it has that old link if they go to that when they go to that page there'll be a button there that says you know support the you know crime busters now they'll click on that it'll bring them the indiegogo campaign and so it basically um keeps the kickstarter campaign alive as a hub to redirect people to indiegogo so it allows you to sort of harness the power of both crowdfunding sites at the same time um it also there's a certain ease to the use um, now, obviously, there's a there's a learning curve to learn how Indiegogo works, how to set up the campaigns and all this stuff. If you've gone through Kickstarter, it is different. It's similar, but it's different. They have some bells and whistles that Kickstarter doesn't have. Um, and so compared to my store, it's a lot easier for me to set up things like add-ons uh, so that when someone goes to check out, it'll come up with a list of things that they can add on to their purchase. That sort of stuff is just easier to do through this sort of campaign. Um, it's also optimized in certain ways for sharing stuff on social media um, and getting boosts on different platforms like Facebook or Twitter in a way that my own account wouldn't be. Um, so having said all that, what are the downsides to doing it besides they're taking you know a cut of it? Well, you still need to be basically promoting your work in the same way that you would be if you were doing it anywhere else. Now, for me, I've recently made the decision not to engage in certain social media platforms because of the negative effect that they have, not just on my mental health, but I think on society at large. And I just don't want to participate in the Facebook ecosystem. Now, I'm in terms of selling my comic, I'm shooting myself in both kneecaps by doing that because I, it's the primary way that I let everybody know that it's out there. And that's even without engaging in Facebook advertisements, which is like the best way that you can promote your comic in terms of getting eyes on it is through buying Facebook ads. I'm also not using Twitter anymore either. And so for me, it's very difficult to actually promote uh, my comic. And as a result, it's really hard for me to drive people to the Indiegogo site. Um, and so a lot of the functionality of having something like this is kind of lost for me because of the choices that I'm making. And um, again, I, I made those choices uh, as just a moral decision for me personally. That's not casting aspersions on anyone who still uses those platforms. But for me, I was just no longer comfortable using them. I did that knowing that it's going to have a severe effect on my ability to promote and sell my comic crime busters because now I'm basically relying on a word of mouth. Um, relying on people who are reading it to tell their friends and have it sort of uh, go actually viral instead of me paying the the services to try and pretend that it's viral. I'm going to actually be relying on fans, old school, telling each other to get it. And with a system like that, um, you lose a lot of sort of the functionality of doing it. Again, there is still a benefit um, because people can stumble across it in larger numbers than they would. Otherwise, um, which is one reason I'm choosing to do it, but um, a lot of the sort of uh, the synergy that you have available with these sort of websites, I'm, I'm personally losing, but it could be very valuable um, to other people. Um, I have set up, you know, uh, I'm going to have links like on my videos like this when I talk about it, they'll 
I'll have the links to the Indiegogo campaign. Um, there's other things that I haven't really looked into yet. Now, on Kickstarter, one of the big things you do while your campaign is active is actually becoming part of the Kickstarter community and um, interacting with other uh, Kickstarter comic creators so that you can cross promote. And uh, there's a whole sort of culture there of people that will that support each other. So I'll back this person's comic because they want them to succeed. They'll back my comic because they want me to succeed. And the result is that a lot of people are backing each other. It's like this self-sustaining ecosystem. Indiegogo has a different community that I am not part of. I've never used Indiegogo before. Um, and so when I'm setting up brand new, this in demand on Indiegogo, I am not receiving the benefit of having built that groundwork. One of the benefits for me of setting up this Indiegogo campaign is actually starting that groundwork. Um, one thing that's that uh, uh, a truism that I've learned is that, particularly with the social media and, and the advertising and stuff, is that um, and just goes across the board for all advertising is that familiarity is a key to getting people to buy your things. So the first time someone sees you know Crime Busters come across their feed. They might be like, oh, that looks kind of interesting. And then the second time they see it, the third time they see it, the fourth time they see it, they may think, oh, it looks kind of neat. But once people see things enough times and they become familiar with it, they're more likely to become interested in it. Um, it and part of that is because it um, it's almost like a proof of concept. You see something once and then you never see it again, and you're kind of like, do I really want to risk my money on this thing that could be a flash in the pan? But if you see it consistently over and over again and it's on multiple platforms, for instance, not just Kickstarter, but also you see the same thing over on Indiegogo, you see it on YouTube, whatever, you see um, the footprint uh, of this, you, you get the idea, okay, this is something that, that's, that's real. Like this isn't going anywhere. Um, this is an established thing. And so it's, it's safe for me to consider uh, spending my money on it. And so... For me personally, setting up the Indiegogo campaign is a way, of, even if the people that are scrolling past keep scrolling past, they're seeing it. They're seeing my name, they're seeing the image, they're seeing Crime Busters, and some of those people may have seen it on other sites, and so it, it sort of creates a familiarity. Do I expect to get a lot of um, like um, organic sales that way for just people stumbling across an Indiegogo? No. Uh, I, I would get almost none on Kickstarter. I don't really expect that. But I have seen, after running three Kickstarter campaigns, I definitely get more organic new readers from the Kickstarter platform now than I did at the beginning because people are seeing, oh, there's a history here. There's It's not just one issue, and it's not just two issues. Now there's three issues. They've all you know, funded and stuff like that. And so by setting this up in the go go it's part of a it's part of a long term strategy to just establish myself um, as someone that's going to be around. And so if you have a um, you know a comic that that you're doing, that may be another benefit for you is just just having it in another venue. It gets more eyes, different eyes, but also you get the same eyes seeing it and becoming more familiar with it. Um, now, so far for me, I've only had it live for. A few days now four or five days um, I'm sharing it you here with you on YouTube but previously I've shared it only with a couple of my communities I haven't had a chance yet to, to share it with for instance people on my email list don't know about it yet um, I haven't had a chance to share it with a lot of my communities I've only shared it with a few people uh, a couple like forums that I'm on and stuff like that um, and so so far nothing I've gotten nothing at all uh, nobody has just stumbled across it on Indiegogo and bought it. And the people that I have been sharing it with are mostly people who have already seen it on other, uh, through other ways, either through my website or through Kickstarter. And they've already either bought it or decided for now not to buy it. So it's not, right now I haven't gotten anything out of it. Um, but for the reasons that I just outlined, I, for me it's valuable to, to do it and to have it. And it may pay off down the line now one thing to know about this is um that indiegogo does have um, a minimum sales requirement to keep it live if you haven't generated a hundred dollars in um pledges 
in the first six months of having your in-demand campaign live, they will cancel the campaign and shut the site down because they figure it's not, nobody wants it. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. I've got six months, um, six months from now, I'm hoping to be um, finishing or close to finishing issue four, which I'm just starting now. I'm being very optimistic that I can do this in six months, but I'm working on, I'm, you know, I started working on issue four now. And so I've got basically six months. And during that time, I am going to have another comic that's coming out, which is Cthulhu versus Uncle Sam. I'll be doing some more videos about that when I get close. That'll be coming out probably the end of June. And so between those things, hopefully I can generate at least $100 over the next six months in order to keep that um, live. I don't know yet what happens. Like when I have my next Kickstarter uh, campaign, assuming that's successful issue four, I don't know if they just update the current campaign in demand page in Indiegogo to reflect the number, the issue four, or if I have to do a whole new one um, to replace that one. Uh, or if they're both live um, simultaneously, I don't really know how that works. Um, so th I'm sort of learning this this stuff myself. Um, but I just wanted to go over this, uh, just the sort of the basics of um, the Indiegogo in demand. I think it's really cool. Um, I do want to say, uh, lastly, that I think um, the the best way to use this is actually to have it set up or go live as soon as you can, right after the end of your campaign. Now, if you're on Indiegogo, it automatically converts to an in-demand um, campaign if you if you decide to opt into it. So as soon as your campaign ends, if you successfully fund it, it becomes in-demand. And so it just keeps going, which I think is great. With Kickstarter, you have to set it up and then you have to email them. There's a bit of a process. Um, I think uh, you can set up these pages in advance and then you once everything's ready, you click a button and it goes live. So I think what you could do is design your Indiegogo page, have it all ready to go. And then as soon as your Kickstarter funds, then you email Indiegogo and tell them. And um, within a day or two, they'll have that live. Um, and so there won't be much of a gap. And that way you can, you can um, include that information in your updates on Kickstarter. That's another thing I'm going to be doing when I update my final update for my campaign where I tell people, uh, hey, all the rewards have gone out. This campaign's over. I'm working on issue four. I'm also going to be able to say, um, if you want more copies or you missed it or you know people that you know, you're excited and you want to tell them about it, the campaign is still going over on Indiegogo and I'll be able to send a link. So uh, that's something where if you can keep the campaign live without much of a break and have it just segue from one end to the next, what that will allow you to do is really capitalize on all the marketing you're doing during the campaign. You know, during the Kickstarter campaign or your Indiegogo campaign, whatever it is, when you're having the launch for an issue, that's when you're really doing, you're doing, if you're paying for advertisements, which I don't do anymore, but if you're paying for advertisements, you're, you're having a big media push, but you're also doing like, interviews like I'm I did like podcast interviews and YouTube interviews and I'm sending out newsletters I'm emailing like critics you know whatever I'm trying to get build up a buzz right so if you can include that buzz um include your ongoing campaign in that buzz and vice versa so you can roll all that effort directly into your ongoing in demand I think that would make a huge difference in basically keeping the momentum of the campaign going something that I'm not was not able to do because my campaign uh, ended two months ago and I'm just now getting to or three months ago because it ended in the beginning of December it took me so long to you know actually finish the book and get it sent out that um, there was a gap in between and so all the momentum I had from running the Kickstarter campaign was all lost and now I'm basically starting from scratch with the Indiegogo campaign that's something you can avoid by planning this in advance and you can take all the momentum of your successful campaign and roll it directly into the in demand and I think it would be a great way to keep the momentum going and also keep the um, your project in the public's eye during the period between issues. Now for me that's a long period because it's usually eight or nine issues uh, months between issues for other people it's shorter. But it, it keeps your project alive um, in between releases so that people are still seeing it and still thinking about it instead of it just disappearing off the map. So anyway, that's it for this video. Just um, 
a lot of uh, little details and, and thoughts about in demand. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great service. I think for me personally, I'm unlikely to get many uh, sales out of it or um, see a whole lot of return on it. But if I can even get a handful of new readers, um, then it will be a success. In fact, if I can get even one new reader out of it, then it was worth all the time setting it up. But particularly if I can get uh, enough people, you know, just a handful of people over the next few months um, to to back it and like it and get over the $100 mark so I can keep perpetuating that site, uh, it would be a huge success for me. And it will also help me in um, selling all of these copies of my comic that the pandemic has left me with stacked all over the house that I expected to be able to sell at conventions and now I'm just struggling to figure out how to how to get out to a public that is all locked away in their houses. So for people like me who are um, struggling in this same situation to um, reach their audience during the pandemic, this is a, another a great option to try. So hopefully this helps some of you other creators. Let me know if you have any questions in the link below. Again, I'm kind of new to indie go go and in demand myself. Um, so I don't know how much I'll be able to answer, but I'm happy to always share my experiences with anybody else. That's the point of these videos is to try and uh, share what I do know about the, co the comic creating process. I am working on um, another big thing that I'm going to be revealing in the next couple of weeks um, that has to do with the Crime Busters. I'm working on uh, getting merchandise. And so that's a whole other topic. Um, it's really interesting, just the, the process from a business then the marketing stuff. Um, and it's another thing that independent comic creators um, don't have to do, but but it's it's actually a lot of fun to get the merchandise out there. So as soon as I have that set up, I'll be sharing that video with everybody as well. I have some samples that are in the mail right now. I'm really excited to get them. And um, so next time you see me, instead of wearing my Count Dante shirt, uh, I might be wearing a Crime Buster shirt, but we'll see how that works out. And I'm really excited for that. But for now, again, thanks very much for watching. I'll have my usual back issue haul video in a couple days so you can see just the piles of old romance books that I'm getting in and some other stuff. There's some non romance coming, um, including, and I'm going to tease it again. Yes, I've got some legendary chick tracks, although even this is a romance. Even Jack Chick can't help himself be tempted by romance comics. But anyway, I've got that video coming up in a couple days and next week I'll be doing, um, I have some other cool uh, old back issue videos coming for you as well. So anyway, thanks very much and I'll see you next time.